hours, which in itself highlighted the gulf between what creditor countries such as Germany and Finland wanted and what the embattled Greeks could offer. In the end, the 16 other Eurozone governments agreed to lend Athens 130 billion euros to be paid out in tranches over the next two years. On top of that, Greece wouldn't have to pay back loans to global banks worth around 100 billion euros. That's the good part. In order to get it, Greece has promised to continue a programme of austerity unseen in a Western democracy in a generation, including mass privatisations of ports, airports and some public utilities, on top of widespread job and wage cuts. The lenders who will oversee that, the IMF, European Central Bank and the EU, collectively known as the Troika, hailed this morning's hard-earned deal. Today's deal is a key remaining building block uh, of our comprehensive crisis response. Uh, and uh, with this agreement, uh, we have uh, a real chance uh, to turn the corner and uh, move from stabilisation to boosting uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation. But the agreement depends crucially on a number of key, and some might say optimistic, assumptions. Firstly, that the cocktail of austerity, fresh loans and bank haircuts will bring Greek national debt as a percentage of its annual income down from its current level of 160% to an equally high 120% by the end of the decade. That assumes a fair wind at its back, a leaked internal EU document says it's more likely that debt will be 129% by 2020. And worse, if Greece's run of bad luck continues, the leaked debt sustainability report says that it may end up owing exactly as much in eight years as it does today, or 1.6 times GDP. The bailout deal also assumes that the private sector will grow enough to make up the shortfall from a dramatically shrinking government sector. That's a big ask given the massive capital flight that Greece has endured over the past two years. We really don't know what might happen in eight years' time. It's very hard to project. Even the projections that were made in 2010 at the time of the first loan are very far uh, from the reality we now see. So I would have thought it's quite difficult, particularly when tax receipts are falling, VAT and other tax receipts in Greece are falling quite sharply. It's very difficult to know that austerity would actually deliver much of an improvement at all. The Greek Finance Minister Evangelos Venatselos says today's deal means that his country avoids a nightmare scenario. And it's true, they do get their bailout and they stay within the warm embrace of the Eurozone. But with unemployment at 21%, GDP shrinking rapidly and private wealth abandoning the country, it's hard to think of any other description for the current situation other than a nightmare scenario. And that's before you drill into the detail of today's deal. <laughs> Like, will the Greek populace accept on the ground what their leaders have bartered in Belgium? With elections planned for late April, opinion polls suggest a big lurch to the extreme parties who may want to tear up today's deal. This second bailout also assumes that Greece's creditor banks accept write-downs in the face value of their bonds of 53.5%, something that they themselves ruled out only last autumn. I think for Greece, uh, the 50% nominal reduction is, in my view, at the borderline of what could be reasonably argued as voluntary. Any further uh, reduction in value and, uh, and losses clearly would be interpreted by market participants as non-voluntary. That begs the most important question. How many of Greece's lenders will sign up for this proposed haircut, which is looking a lot more like an all-over blade one? Greece said tonight that at least two-thirds of its creditors had to sign up for the debt write-off to work. If they don't reach that threshold, it might be Europe's banks rather than its political elite which will finally pull the plug on Greece. So to find out, earlier I spoke to the man who's been at the forefront of the Greek debt talks, the managing director of the Institute for International Finance, Charles Delara. I asked him how much of the 200 billion euros worth of public sector debt in Greece he represented? We technically represent just under half of that, just under 100 billion euro, although we have communication with an investor base that's much larger, but our formal representation is just under 100 billion euro. Is this deal dependent upon a certain level of participation then? Certainly it is. We have not judged, nor has the uh, Greek government set a particular minimum threshold. 
But certainly, I think we all realize that for this economic program to work and for the cloud of debt burden to be sufficiently cleared off the Greek horizon, that we will need very high participation in this deal, and we're going to work to achieve that. But you have no guarantee you'll get a very high level of participation, do you? No, no guarantee at all, Jeremy. You know, you do the best you can in designing these deals. Uh, we respect the right that each investor, including the members of our own steering committee who have endorsed the basic parameters of this deal, has the right to look at the documentation, evaluate the benefits and cost of the deal, and make their own judgment. But we do feel quite confident that once investors have sorted through the documentation, looked at the parameters, looked at the benefits, which are substantial, that uh, a large number of investors will come in. Uh, what proportion of their loans will investors lose? They will lose uh, just over 50% of the nominal value of their current claims. But in terms of the net present value, the economic value of the loans, they will lose just north of 70%. There is substantial loss embedded in this deal, and there's no use trying to hide that. It was necessary if we were to deal effectively and determinately with the scale of debt burden, which Greece simply is unable to cope with. But by your own admission, you only represent about half of the total debt exposure here. What is to stop someone like a hedge fund or someone who has bought Greek debt trying to trigger the insurance involved in a credit default swap? Well, there's nothing uh, that I'm aware of, Jeremy, that will definitively stop someone who wants to take such action. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is no ironclad uh, guarantee, as we discussed earlier, that individual investors may not contemplate um, counterproductive activity here. Uh, they have their rights, they have the legal rights, they have their market uh, judgments to make, but we are convinced that when you look at the total picture here, that the overwhelming bulk of investors will consider this a favorable transaction which benefits not only the narrow contours of their balance sheet, but the broader contours of the marketplace, which after all, is much more important in the long run than just what this does to their Greek holdings. Sure, but if the insurance system worked, they could recover perhaps 100% of the money they've lent the Greeks instead of something like 30%. It's not inconceivable. If too many go in that direction, though, the system breaks down, we will not have a successful conclusion of this deal, and then where will they be? You know, judgment calls have to be made here. And I'm encouraged that the overwhelming bulk of investors we've been in communication with, not just those that we formally represent, but those that are outside the formal umbrella of our steering committee and our investor committee, but with whom we have been discussing the broad strategy, see the broader benefits of this. We'll have to wait and see, of course, and it'll be up to the Greeks working with their agents to go out and mobilize support. But once we see the formal final details of the offer, we're also going to give support to this deal as best we can. But Mr. Delara, of course European governments believe in saving the euro. It's the only game in town. It's a political project. You're acting and talking as if these financial institutions are some sort of charity. No, I just think that uh, most of the CEOs that we work with, and it's a wide range of financial institutions. It includes state-owned insurance firms, it includes private insurance firms, banks, hedge funds, asset management firms, uh, not just headquartered in Europe, but also in, in the U.S. and elsewhere. The bulk of the CEOs have a broad perspective of what's in the interest of their balance sheet and their investor base. And that is why they do not consider this a, an, an issue of charity. They consider it an issue of looking at long-term long -term cost and benefits. Mr. Delara, thanks very much. Thank you. Now, the Education Secretary claimed today that the government was marching...